Hi, in today's discussion, we're going to give a quick overview of Vedic civilization. See, among different chapters of Indian history that we study, after Indus Valley civilization, one of the most important civilizations, must, one of the most important eras which impacted Indian history was the Vedic civilization. As we have seen in the previous discussions, that approximately about 1750 BC, the Indus Valley civilization went through a decline. Now, as Indus Valley declined, historians have seen emergence of an entirely new civilization called the Vedic civilization. See, the Vedic civilization extended from approximately 1750 BC up until 600 BC. Now, as Indus Valley civilization declined, the Vedic civilization came into existence. So, please understand, for study purposes, while we say Indus Valley civilization as a time period ending between approximately 1750 BC and Vedic civilization as a time period starting from 1750 BC, one must be very clear that these were not actually events happening one after the other, but rather while this was happening, the Indus Valley decline was happening, Vedic civilization saw an emergence. So, Vedic period we categorize as 1750 BC to 600 BC. Even among this, for our comfort to study purposes, we categorize Vedic civilization into two periods. One period is 1750 BC to 1000 BC. The second period is 1000 BC to 600 BC. First 750 years, that is 1750 BC to 1000 BC is called early Vedic. We will see the details of early Vedic as we go a little more into the discussion. The second part. 1000 BC to 600 BC is later Vedic, the second 600 years. The, the origin of Indus Valley civilization was quite unknown. Very similarly, even the Vedic civilization's origin is not very concrete. We do not know exactly where they come from. There are three different theories which are given. Indo-Aryan migration theory which basically means that Vedic people most probably came from the Aryan region which is the steppes of Central Asia, the steppe region of Central Asia. There is another theory which is given as Indo-European which basically again goes almost similar to that model of Indo-Aryan. The only difference they say is Vedic people were actually a linguistic community. The word linguistic community basically means people who speak a similar language across different geographical regions. People who speak an exactly similar language across different geographical regions. And then there is a whole set of historians who say no, no, Vedic people actually came from India only. The native origin theory. They believe Vedic people lived or emerged from the Sapta Sindhu river system. The Indus river and its tributaries. For example, Bal Gangadhar Tilak says Vedic people came from the Arctic region. Swami Dayanan Saraswati of Arya Samad says they came from Tibet. Historian Max Miller, who was also one of the greatest Indologists, says Vedic people came from Central Asia, mainly the Steppes region. For this, he also quotes a particular inscription called the Bogaskoy inscription. It is basically located in Turkestan region. Turkestan is present day Xinjiang province of China. There we have an inscription which actually talks about Vedic gods, Indra, Vayu, Varuna, Agni. One of the oldest, earliest archaeological evidences 
of the Vedic people is the Bogasco inscription. Similarly, historian J. D. Rod says Vedic people were actually a community which emerged from Bactria. Bactria is present day Afghanistan. The present day Afghanistan is Bactria. Okay. So there are multiple theories. Some say they are from Indo Aryan, some say they are Indo European, some say they are from the Sapta Sindhu River. The Sapta Sindhu region or the Indus River in the Seven River System region is these are the Sapta Sindhu rivers. Indus River in our Vedic culture, in our Vedic text is known as Sindhu. Jhelum River is referred to as Vitas. Chenab as Askini. Ravi River, Parushini. Bias, Vipas. Satlaj, Sutudri. And also the ancient river of Saraswati, which is synonymous to present day Ghagar River. This river system, this Sapta Sindhu river system has also been extremely important in your Indus Valley Civilization study, right. Whatever may be their origin, whatever may have been their starting point, Vedic people were largely settled in Ganga, Yamuna, Doab section. They were located, they were settled in the Ganga, Yamuna, Doab section, which is the present day UP Bihar region. Now, as I say, we categorize Vedic people into two periods, the early Vedic people from 1750 BC to 1000 BC and the later Vedic people from 1000 BC to 600 BC. One story which everybody, most of the historians do agree, those who suggest that Aryans actually migrated from outside or those who approve Aryan invasion theory, those who approve Aryan migration theory agree that Aryans did come, they migrated, eliminating Dasyus. Now, this word Dasyu is not clearly mentioned, but in one of the books of Vedas, which is Rig Veda, which actually mentions Dasyus as phallus worshippers. Phallus is similar to Linga of Shiva. Most probably Vedic people came, they might have attacked the indigenous local Dasyus and then eventually settled with them. That is what the theory which is said that Aryan invaded or Aryans migrated. Vedic people introduced chariots into India. Aryans or Vedic people are also clearly mentioned as chariot riders. They are always called as chariot riders. Remember this consistently. And one of the first literary evidence about these Vedic kings is coming from a small event called Dasa Rajna Yuddha. Means the Dasa means ten, Rajna kings, Yuddha fight, the battle of ten kings. General story which is said is it was actually fought between a Vedic tribe whose king was Sudhas and the tribe was Bharata. They fought with Purus. Eventually Purus were defeated. Puru tribe, Bharata tribe combined to become Kauravas. Now something similar to this is what was later written as Mahabharata. This Bharata king Sudhas, his five skills are the ones which are defined as the Pancha Pandavas in Mahabharata. We believe this Dasaragna Yuddha is actually the earliest reference to the story of Mahabharata, the great battle of Mahabharata. Now, Vedic people are actually iron ore people. This is where we see the usage of iron ore, iron access, iron settlements because see, if you observe, they moved from Indus Valley region up until Ganga Yamuna Doab. Now, this Ganga Yamuna Doab is an iron rich. It happens to be iron rich territory even today. Your Jharkhand, UP, Bihar, Chhattisgarh section even today has a lot of iron ore. Western Gangetic Plains. And these Vedic people, the Vedic society started originally as a semi-nomadic community that is 
people who moved from place to place to place eventually became a permanently settled state or commonly in your textbooks it is written as sedentary the word sedentary means settled stationary and vedic culture is a painted grayware culture you can say pottery with black or gray color and most of this painted grayware was only observed in the last period of the vedic people that is the later vedic period whose time period i have already told in the introduction approximately 1000 bc to 600 bc time and again i always keep telling this all the years all the timelines i am referring to are essentially a reference only they are meant for you to keep a track you can add 1000 years remove 1000 years from this you know plus or minus 1000 is okay because historian to historian this changes now one of the most important sources of reading vedic people are the four vedas everybody knows there are four vedas rigveda yajur veda samaveda atharva veda rig yajur sam athar again among this always remember the first veda mother veda you can say the veda which is also called apurushaya apurushaya means a purushaya not given by man is rigveda rigveda is actually world's oldest book one of the oldest books even by most liberal estimates we give the date of rigveda approximately 1500 bc rigveda originally has 10 mandalas a mandala means a book so rigveda itself is a collection of 10 books 10 mandalas or 10 books consisting of 1028 shlokas or suktas 1028 suktas hymns shlokas or small two line poem types mandala 2 to mandala 7 are the oldest 1 and 10 are the youngest these were later additions mandala 1 and mandala 10 were not part of the original rigveda they were added later and every mandala consists of eulogies or suktas which is prashamsas and rasas which is praise of different different kings different different people different different saints different different priests and then padas are small shlokas or you can say mantras so essentially if you observe based on what i said now mandala clearly looks like essentially a collection of poems that's it so rigveda doesn't give you explanation of anything it essentially gives you a poem after poem after poem like for example different mantras best mantra most of the most popular mantra is the gayatri mantra mentioned only in rigveda the ninth mandala is devoted to the god soma and 10th mandala which is a later edition consists of purusha sukta purusha men sukta rule purusha sukta rules for the men this is what consists of the varnashrama because manusmriti Manusmriti, which was compiled during the Gupta period, is part of the Varnashrama. Or Manusmriti is the source of Varnashrama. Manusmriti is mentioned under Purusha Sukta in Rigveda, the Chatur Varnashrama. Rigveda also has an attached Brahmana. See, every Veda is essentially a poem. A Veda, if you read by itself, you can't understand much because they are just poems they need to be given explanations those explanatory books are called brahmanas brahmanas are basically prose explanations 
of Veda. Prose explanation of a Veda is a Brahmana. So, Rig Veda has three Brahmanas. Aitreya Brahmana, Kaushtika Brahmana, Samkhyana Brahmana. So, it gives you details of each of the mandalas. Some mandalas are mentioned in Aitreya Brahmana, some are mentioned in Kaushtika Brahmana. Then each mandala is described. Like for example, Gayatri Mantra. What does the statement of Gayatri Mantra mean? What are the preconditions of it? What are the first conditions of it? All of this is detailed explained in Aitreya Brahmana. Supportive of Rig Veda is Yajur Veda. Yajur Veda, Yajus means ritual or Yagna. All our rules of Yagna, all our rules of rituals, uh, Yagna, Homa, everything is coming from Yajur Veda. That's why Yajurveda is also called the book of Advaryus or priests. The priests must follow the process of the ritual based on Yajurveda. It gives the procedures, the techniques, the rituals. See, there are some yagnas where you can't touch the uh, water with your fingers. Rather, you touch with a leaf. In some, you touch with a flower. In some you put uh, ghee in the yagna from the front, in some you put from the back. All these rules are mentioned in Yajurveda. Which ritual, which technique? It has two types. Shukla Yajurveda, Krishna Yajurveda. Shukla, white. Krishna, black. Basically, Shukla Yajurveda discusses strict static rituals. There are some yagnas or some rituals which do not change from community to community, people to people to region to region. They remain the same. Like for example, Pinda Pradhana, after the people's death, the Karma Kanda which people do, it doesn't change based on your Varna or your community or your region or your tradition. It remains the same. Those are mentioned in Shukla Yajurveda. That's why it is sometimes mentioned as white rituals. Krishna Yajurveda are those which are very dynamic, black rituals. For example, marriage. Marriage changes from community to community, varna to varna, even within the same varna, it remains different. Some people put a fire and go round round, some people don't put fire and still go round round. Some people don't go round round at all. So it depends. Those kind of rituals which are not very static, which are not fixed, those are called Krishna Yajurveda. And so Krishna Yajurveda rituals keep changing from generation to generation, region to region, people to people. All of this is mentioned in Yajurveda. Yajurveda, just like Rig Veda, is also supported by some Brahmanas. Kashtaka Brahmana, Maitreyani Brahmana, Kapilatakata Brahmana, and Tatriya Brahmana. Again, these are, as I said, Brahmanas are pros explanatory systems. They explain shlokas which are mentioned in Yajur Veda. The third, third Veda is Sama Veda. Commonly you can believe or you can remember Sama Veda as the Veda of music and mantra. This is the Veda of melodies, Veda of chants. This is the Veda which is related to public worship. For example, our uh, musical traditions, the Sargam, Sari, Gama, Padhani, the seven Swaras, the musics, and even the small mantras. There are mantras for everything in Veda. For passing an exam, for your friend failing an exam, you chant a mantra, Vashikaran mantra, Dhyana mantra, Utpadana mantra. The Dhana Mantra, there are mantras for everything. All of those sources, Sama Veda. 1549 verses or shlokas. 75 verses all have been taken from Rig Veda except 75. 75 are non Rig Vedic. Now, a doubt may come to you, sir. How are they adding those? During the Gupta period, until Gupta period, remember 
Vedas were essentially oral tradition. They were not written. There is no book. The first time when Vedas were even written on Talapatras is during the Gupta era. When writing these in Gupta era, all these additions and amendments were done. There are two Upanishadas which are part of Samaveda. The Chandogya Upanishad, Kena Upanishad. Upanishada basically means a philosophical book. After you read Vedas, you get explained about the Vedas in Brahmanas. Eventually, you can question the Veda in a series of books called Aranyakas. Once you read Veda, Brahmana, Aranyaka, you get to read Upanishada. Upanishada is a philosophical book where you ask metaphysical questions, you try to understand different intricacies and different information of Vedas from a very deep perspective. Chandokya Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, like this there are 108 Upanishads each associated to some or the other Veda. Chandogya, Kena are attached to Samaveda. Samaveda is considered as the root of Indian classical music and dance because the mother of Indian music and classical dance is Gandharva Vedam. There is a small Veda called Gandharva Veda and also Natya Shastra written by Bharata Muni. They both are part of Samaveda. Natya Shastra by Bharata Muni and Gandharva Veda. They both are part of Samaveda. So, all our songs, all our classical music come from Samaveda. There are three recensions of the text of Samaveda. I mean, three ways of projecting it. Jaiminiya, the one given by Saint Jaimini. Ranayana, given by Rana. And Kaudhuma, Kaustaba gave this. Different, different ways of presenting Samaveda. Samaveda Samhita is not meant to be read as a text. It is like a musical score sheet that must be heard. That is why, I mean, this has always been the tradition. Samaveda is not something like you take a book and start reading it. It has always been a recital. The guru recited it to the student. When the student becomes the guru, he recites it to the student. So, Samaveda has always travelled from generation to generation to generation in a sequence. Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda. These three are actually Vedas about say ritual, about music, about beliefs, about discipline. Atharva Veda is strictly Purushaya, given by man, given for man. It is given by man, given for man. It is entirely different in the style in presentation. It is not really about shlokas here. It is essentially a combination of all those popular beliefs and superstitions which people follow. Like for example, we have this very small minor beliefs. You are walking, black cat, don't go across. Three people should not start a job. Never sleep putting your head towards the north side in your house because when you wake up, you will see south and south is Yama. All this sort of beliefs. Even breaking of coconut has a rule. Like the hair of the coconut, if it is outside, it is for the evil. If it is towards you, then it is for good. So these sort of belief systems, they don't have any reason. They don't have any logic. They don't have any uh, specific backup for it. These are beliefs which people follow. And all such beliefs which may not really have an astrological or a ritual or a religious reason, all of those are followed by Atharva Veda. That's why Atharva Veda is sometimes also called Folk Veda. People's Veda. Two divisions in Atharva Veda. Paipalada, Saunakya, just like Shukla. Krishna of Yajur Veda, this also has two. It is divided into 20 khandas. Khandas means parts like paragraphs, 711 shlokas, 5987 mantras in Atharva Veda. There is only one Brahmana to an Atharva Veda, the Gopata Brahmana. So there are four Vedas Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, 
Samaveda, Atharvaveda. And Atharvaveda, basically, as I reiterated, remember, it is all about magical formulas, magical belief systems. Blind beliefs mainly associated with folk traditions. Mainly associated with folk traditions. They may not really be for all the people. Atharva Veda is well known to have been a Purushaya mantra given by, most probably it was given by Rishi Jaimini for the people. Generally, when you are reading about Vedas, you hear a term called Veda Samhita. Samhita basically means Sama collection, hitas, shlokas, a collection of shlokas. So, all the four Vedas, Rig Ved, Yajur Ved, Sama Ved, Atharva Ved, all of these together are called Veda Samhita. Vedic compositions together in a single collection are called Veda Samhita. And as I said, Brahmanas give us commentary, give us explanations of the Vedas. Every Brahmana has a book of reason called Aranyaka, where you can actually understand the reasons which are given in the Brahmana. Then comes the book of Upanishad. Upanishadas are philosophical doctrines which essentially talk about metaphysical things. Aranyakas, as I said, very important. Texts on rituals, ceremonies, sacrifices, they talk about moral reasoning. The moral reasoning for a particular mantra. And as the word says Aranyaka, these have to be read only in the forest or these are written and read in the forest. The reason being, they are not for everybody. They are only for those who have already read Veda and the Brahmana once. So, Aranyakas are generally supposed to be studied or compiled only outside the regular civilization. That is why Aranyaka. Main two types, Chandogya Aranyaka, Jaimini Aranyaka, two types of them. By people who live in forests, as I said, outside the regular civilization. Aranyakas focus on meditation. They are contrary to the regular rituals and sacrifices which are mentioned in Yajur Veda. And the last part of Veda Samhita, as I said, Upanishadas. The literal meaning of the word Upa Anishada means to sit down near someone. These are philosophical books generally studied only in the Guru Shishya Parampara. They give out discussions about philosophy, spiritual knowledge. They are sometimes also called Veda Anta, means the end of Vedas because they are supposed to be the last part of Vedas. First three part, Veda, Brahmana, Aranyaka give you the knowledge. Upanishadas let you question the knowledge and re-understand it. Total 108 Upanishads. All ancient philosophies, less important ceremonies, sacrifices, everything put together. Okay. It questions nature, it questions fate of soul, Atma, Paramatma discussions. All of these are mentioned in Upanishadas. Upanishadas also give a sort of spiritual interpretation to Vedas. Most famous uh, quotation that all of you know, Satyam Eva Jayate, which is written under the emblem of India. Emblem has been in use a lot. Mundaka Upanishad. It's coming from Mundaka Upanishad. Satyam Eva Jayate. Truth alone shall triumph. This entire corpus of Veda Samhita forms a major part of Vedic literature. Samhitas. A Veda Samhita includes Veda, four of them, plus Brahmana, plus Aranyaka, 
प्लस उपनिषद वेद संहिता इन जनरल सेंस इज बेसिकली कॉल्ड श्रुति और श्रुति लिटरेचर श्रुति लिटरेचर मींस दोज विच हैव टू बी हर्ड एंड रिसाइटेड नॉट टू बी री इंटरप्रेटेड सो द गुरु सेस शिष्या लिजन ही टेल्स टू हिस्स स्टूडेंट ही टेल्स टू हिस्स स्टूडेंट About the Smriti literature, we'll continue in the next session. There is more to Vedic literature and Vedic society. That's it in this session. Thank you. Bye bye.